Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was pretty good. <laughs> Our call to worship this morning is uh, from Psalm 38, 21 and 22. Do not forsake me, O Lord. O my God, be not far from me. Make haste to help me. O Lord, my salvation. Well, boy, what a gorgeous weekend we had again this weekend. The Lord is really showing his, uh, his uh, majesty. It's just, just a gorgeous day. Thank him for it. Um, does anybody remember being 14? I can't remember that. They're all, wow, two people. Well, guess what? Leah is going to be 14 tomorrow. Happy birthday. Are <laughs> you guys as happy with me as your sister was? I announced uh, the birthday. So, uh, hey, we all wish we could be 14 when we get hair like this. I'm just saying. Like, uh, I'll trade you age or hair, whichever one you'd like to trade. Hey, guys, you know, uh, <laughs> somebody appreciate that. In preparation for Thanksgiving, we're going to have a family dinner and activity night on Wednesday. It's supposed to be November 16th from 6 until 7.45. So be sure to make plans to attend that. And we have a weekly family devotional. This is it. It's uh, on the theme of thankfulness, and it's available out in the uh, narthex. So grab one of these uh, on your way out and uh, look through that information. Folks, we are in need of volunteers for Children's Church. We value children in this church greatly, and uh, your help uh, could be invaluable. Um, all it would be is if you're just willing to give 20 or 25 minutes uh, out of the morning service uh, once every few months. So we're not asking for every single week. We're just saying, hey, once in a while, could you volunteer uh, to help out with our kids? And uh, I know you're capable of doing it. We're empowered through the Holy Spirit to do everything. And that would be something the Holy Spirit might empower us to do. I'm just saying. Um, next week for adult Bible school, or for Sunday school, we're going to have a guest speaker um, from the Whitcliffe Bible Translators. So we'll be here for that. And uh, uh, during our Sunday school hour, we'll have that, that individual speaker. Are there any other announcements before we uh, go to the Lord and the song? Great. Yes. Yeah. Uh, if you look at the insert in your bulletin this morning, there's an announcement there about Trail Life. Uh, this is a, a ministry that we are hoping to launch here in January. Uh, it's very similar to Boy Scouts in the way that it's structured and a lot of the activities that we do, but with a much more intentional Christ-centered focus. Uh, and uh, if you're interested in learning more about this, we're going to have an information meeting here on, uh, what day we've got there? Wednesday, November 30th. 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock in Ward Hall. We're going to have some of the regional representatives from the Trail Life organization there to answer any questions you might have. So if that's something that you are interested in as a family, uh, or you just want to know more about it, uh, come check it out. If you know someone who might be interested, invite them to come be a part of it. Uh, we are also looking into starting up American Heritage Girls, which is a similar program, but focused on the young ladies rather than the young men. Uh, but we need some leadership in order to make that happen. So if you are willing to serve either in a board role, where you're just doing some of the, the background of organization stuff, or as a frontline leader where you're actually working with the girls with Trail Life, please let me know because we'd love to get that rolling about the same time. Excellent. Yeah, and we have already for the Trail Life for the boys, we have uh, an Eagle Scout, a dad who has four Eagle Scout sons, and a washed up Cub Scout man. So uh, yeah, we'll yeah, get that thing off the, off the ground. It's, what it's going to be is going to be a great time for you to connect with your daughter or with your son or with your grandson or your granddaughter. So uh, um, it should be a good time to be able to get that off the ground. Are there any other announcements? Uh, Greg, yes, you did say the sign up was out there for families, but today is supposed to be the last day for, no, no, next week. It's supposed yes. to be the last day for signing up. So. Sign up for the family night. Oh, the family night. Okay, hey, get on that. You have this week and next week. So, uh, hey, stuff to do around the church. Take advantage of that. Yeah, please, please sign up for that. And those devotionals that uh, Greg held up are right uh, in the same place as the sign up sheet for the family night. So, you're out there, 
in that area, go ahead and grab one of those and sign up for the family night. Yes, sir. This is like the announcement on November 19th, McKenna has been offered to go to Larry High School where we have the college coaches there to look at some of the freshmen and sophomores that had a good soccer season this year. So there'll be college coaches there scouting these kids with the opportunity to play with each other. So just keep her in prayers throughout all that. Excellent. November 19th. Good job, man. Or not All right, let's go. Anyone else? Okay, well, let's look to the Lord in prayer before we uh, worship Him in song. Father God, what a gorgeous day you provided for us to be in your house, and we're, we're glad to be here. Father, we'd ask that you would uh, send your Holy Spirit here to be amongst us, and that we would be able to worship you in spirit and truth, because God, Lord, you truly are great, and we love you. Amen. <clears throat> Please stand if you're able and help us sing praises to the Lord.
always to come before our Lord in prayer, humbly beseeching Him with the concerns that are on our hearts and praising Him for the blessings that He showers upon us. I'd like to direct your attention to the prayer concerns that we have in our bulletin here today. I would ask that you would keep these in your prayers throughout the week. Um, I particularly want to uh, highlight Myra Best is now home. And she's continuing to recover from knee surgery, so that is going very well indeed. Please keep Myra in your prayers. Uh, also, I received an email yesterday um, about uh, I'm blanking on the name. Jerry, the, uh, our missionaries uh, over in Southeast Asia. Thank you, Michael and Lupe. Uh, please, uh, please keep them in your prayers. Michael has, uh, come down. What's that? Yes, dengue fever, which is, um, not, not particularly dangerous, but extremely unpleasant. A cousin of malaria. Yes, it's a cousin of malaria. Uh, so, uh, you know, have a nice picture of him laid out in his, in his bed there, and see recover from that. So please keep Michael and Lupe in, uh, in your prayers as he is recovering from that. Uh, also we also need to pray for our Mission of the Month here team challenge. Um, and this is our last Sunday that they are our Mission of the Month. But please keep their work in your prayers as well. Are there any other prayer requests or praises we'd like to share before going to prayer this morning? Kristen? Uh, for next Saturday, it's Saint Thomas for all the well and Martin Jones area.
praise God for that. And you guys are going to be hitting the road here pretty shortly, is that right? right. You guys head back to Maryland? Yeah. Alright. Well, we'll be praying for you as you guys uh, are taking that trip also. Thank you. Certainly. Jen. Um, I think, first, I think, Judy, you told us that Jay David was having some trouble with his transmission on the road, so prayers for Jay and his dad, for Jay Crabb, who's traveling with his dad. And then, um, just in general, we kind of have been so hard at work um, interfering with marriages and other relationships, and just pray that God would help us to know how to love each other well in a way that the person receiving the love can really experience it. Just pray for your safe travels. I know my family is going to be traveling a lot in the month of November, and I'm sure with the holidays, everybody's going to. So just safe travels for everybody. as well as those in our hearts and minds, let's go to our Lord in prayer. We'll conclude with the words of the Lord's Prayer, which you can find that time here on the wall behind me. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we come to you this morning in faith. Praising you for your goodness your glory, your love towards us. 
Lord, we thank you for all the ways in which you blessed us, for all the opportunities that we have. May we use all of these, Lord, to bring you glory. We come before you humbly, bearing before us all of these concerns and needs that we have mentioned here today. And Lord, we ask that you would be in the midst of all these situations. And our prayer always, Lord, is for healing, for restoration to health and to life, for protection in all manner of things. Because, Lord, we believe that that is in accordance with your will. But, Lord, we acknowledge that your ways are higher than ours. And so we pray for these things, entrusting them to your care, and your promise. Uh, Lord, we pray for those who are in the midst of transitions. Lord, for Seth and his family, for the Jetnik family, uh, for Diana. Lord, be with them. We pray. For those who are dealing with various sorts of health. Lord, for Dottie, for Allison, for Corey, for Becky and Mandy. Lord, for, for Chris and his tooth. Lord, for Greg and uh, Myra as they're continuing on the road to recovery. Lord, for, for Chris and Dawn and Aaron, Fran, and Brian, Lord, and Michael. We pray, Lord, about those help. Lord, we lift Serana up to you in the third trimester. And we pray for Logan as he is preparing to enter basement training. Lord, be with him through that and strengthen his faith through what he experiences there. Lord, we, we praise you for the arrival of a new member of the Sabbath family here shortly. We pray for safety and health in that delivery. We pray, Lord, for all those who are traveling now or in the next few weeks as the holiday season approaches, and particularly, Lord, for the, the Sabbaths and the Namics as they are in the midst of travel. We pray, Lord, for liberty, that you would recover quickly, and for the Robbins family, that you will be with them and watch over their health. Lord, we, we praise you for the opportunities that we have for the for musicians to be able to compete in these state band finals. Lord, for, for men to gather and grow in you. Lord, we thank you that we have the, the right in this nation to elect our leaders. We pray for wisdom in these upcoming elections here in just over a week. Lord, we pray that you would guide the voters of this nation. That they might listen to you. That we might choose wisely and well. And we pray, Lord, that you would send your angels to surround the holy places. But in this time of such fraught division, this election proceeds smooth, proceed smoothly and safely and well. We pray, Lord, for the division in this nation. We pray, Lord, that people would turn towards you and find truth and hope not in partisan politics, but in your Son, the Lord Jesus. We pray that you would heal the divisions of this land. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful as your church here in this place. That through what we do here in our local community, and the 
things that we do that have a national and even global reach. Your gospel might go forth. And the light, the hope, the truth, and the light shine forth. Lord, we pray all these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That we pray also under the pattern that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. I'd like you to stand as we receive our morning offering and our elders bring this forward. Let's join in praising God using the words of the doxology. Stand and sing.
is an aircraft carrier accompanied by two cruisers, four destroyers, and numerous support ships. Alter your course immediately, or we will undertake measures to defend this task force. The reply came back once more. Do whatever you have to. This is a lighthouse. <laughs> We like to be in control. We like to be in charge. But sometimes you have to listen to something greater than you are. Tomorrow is Halloween. We're almost done with this season in which so many people choose to celebrate dark and scary things. And over the past few weeks, we've been looking at some of these dark and scary things. We began this series with a quote from G.K. Chesterton, in which he noted that the monsters we find in fairy tales and fiction let us put a face and form on the evil that's in the world to teach us that evil can, in fact, be defeated. Ultimately, though, you and I aren't the heroes that defeat the monsters. Jesus is. As Christians, we trust in Jesus to give us victory over the evil in our world and the evil in our lives. And we seek to be like Jesus, not the monsters. Now, some of the most common villains you find in these kinds of stories are witches. From Hansel and Gretel to Snow White to the Wizard of Oz, wicked witches show up all over the place and cause no end of trouble. They're not physically threatening, like some of the other monsters we've looked at, which is are scary because they use magic. They might curse you or put a spell on you by using otherworldly powers. Now throughout this series, we focus on the symbolism of monsters. We know they're fictional, but they're great illustrations of different kinds of evil. This morning's topic is a little different. Witchcraft isn't just a symbolic evil, it's something that people throughout history have actually tried to do. So before we get into the symbolism, we need to talk a little bit about the reality. Now we tend to think of magic as something that belongs to the realm of make-believe. It's not real. And in fact, that's where we usually find it. We're all products of the modern world, you and I. We can't help it. It's how we grew up, what surrounds us. And one of the hallmarks of the modern worldview is that the physical, material world is what really matters. The physical world that you can see and touch is what's most real. And modernity doesn't know quite what to do with the spiritual, with the supernatural. It either denies the existence of such things outright, or it relegates them to the realm of unserious personal opinion. You can believe whatever you want about such things, but you shouldn't pressure anyone else to agree with you. That's the order of the day. Viewpoints based on religious beliefs are increasingly ruled out of bounds in public discourse. Maybe you've noticed this. The way to win an argument today is by appealing, rightly or wrongly, to science. Science studies the cause and effect dynamics of the natural world. And science is great. We've got so much more knowledge today. Our, our quality of life is better because of the advances made possible by scientific exploration and investigation of our world. But anything that's not part of the natural world is simply beyond the scope of science. Science is a great means of investigation for the physical world that we see. But it doesn't have the tools to deal with the spiritual or supernatural because those kinds of things, by definition, do not follow the rules of the natural order. And since modern people believe that the physical world is what really matters, we tend to use the methods of exploring the physical world to tell us what's true and false. 
not just what's true about the natural order, but what's true in an ultimate sense. And so the modern world treats magic as a bunch of superstition and nonsense. It's just not real. It belongs to the harmless world of fiction. And that's where you're most likely to find it today, at least here in the modern West. Today, magic is just a plot element in stories that want to imagine a world that's not bound by the limitations of natural laws. And this kind of magic works in different ways depending on who's writing the story, but most often it's just a kind of superpower. A great example of this is the very popular Harry Potter series. It has characters called witches and wizards who do magic, but this power doesn't really come from anywhere in particular. You're just bored with it. And if you've got the mojo, all you need to do is wave a magic stick and mutter some vaguely Latin sounding phrases, and you can violate the laws of physics with total abandon. These kinds of stories, they can be a lot of fun. And there's nothing wrong with enjoying them as long as you have the ability to discern between fantasy and reality. But magic in history is something quite different. This modern worldview that you and I grew up with is really only a few hundred years old. And it's not universal around the globe even today. People in other times and places take the idea of the supernatural world far more seriously than we do. Even more seriously than those of us who believe in God and know that there is a spiritual, supernatural world. Just because of the way we've grown up and what surrounds us, we often tend to operate according to the conventions of the modern worldview. That's why there's so often a discrepancy between what we say we believe and how we actually operate in the world because we are very apt to conform to the pattern of the world that doesn't take spiritual things seriously. Now, in other parts of the world, other times throughout history, uh, people have taken the spiritual and the supernatural very, very seriously. And yes, a lot of the things that they believe are indeed superstition and nonsense, but not all of them. After all, the Bible itself teaches us that there is more to reality than just what we can see. And the unseen world, the spiritual world, is in some ways more real and more important than the material world. 2 Corinthians 4.18 notes, We look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Again, Paul writes in Colossians 3, 3 and 4, Your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's this whole spiritual dimension to reality. There's a spiritual dimension to you and to your life. And one thing we take away from Scripture is that you better get your spiritual life in order. You've got to get things right with the supernatural. You've got to get things right with God. And the way that we do that is through Jesus Christ. He is the one who died on the cross to make atonement for our sin, who rose again in victory over sin and death, to grant us new and everlasting life. An invitation is open to any who will repent of their sins and trust in the Lord Jesus and receive his grace through faith. And Jesus teaches us to focus on the more lasting and more significant spiritual reality, even though we still live in this modern world. On Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Later on, he says not to be anxious about our material needs, but to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you as well. So to recap here, 
we understand as Christians that there is a spiritual world, that this is a part of our reality, that our modern world often just kind of tends to ignore. And, and if Jesus comes to save us, so that our spiritual condition can be set right. And then when we look at the world around us, we recognize that what we do in this physical world, the material world, ought to be preparing us for an eternity in the kingdom of God. We are using the, the, the physical, material world, our life here, to grow spiritually. And to, to make our eternity that much better. That the, the physical is in service to the spiritual. But not everybody looks at things this way. Some people who believe in the supernatural are fixated on their situation here and now. And throughout history, some of them have tried to tap into the power of the spiritual world to make things happen in the physical world. In other words, this is the exact opposite of, as Christians, how we're supposed to think about things and, and, and operate. You have people who understand that there is a spiritual reality out there, there is power in the spiritual realm, and we're going to try to use the spiritual in order to make things better for us in the physical realm. We're going to try to invite the spiritual power in somehow to be able to do stuff here that is to our advantage and benefit. That's what magic historically is. It's not just a special power that comes from nowhere. If you're going to try to bypass the normal laws of cause and effect in the world you can see, there's only one other place you can go to try to find power. Magic, historically, is an attempt to coerce or control spiritual beings to do your bidding. In Acts 19.19, 19, we read about new converts to Christ who used to do this sort of thing before they were saved. Scripture says that a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. Books of magic of this sort, they usually contain formulas or lists of names that were purported to bind spiritual forces to your will. And people believed in this enough to pay a lot of money for them. But these new believers immediately understood that this sort of thing was utterly incompatible with following Christ. Even back in the Old Testament, the Lord warned his people about this kind of thing. Deuteronomy 18, 19-12, we read, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who burns his son or daughter in offering, anyone who practices divination, or tells fortunes, or interprets, interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or a charter, or a medium, or a necromancer, or one who inquires of the dead. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God is driving them out before you. The King James Version of the Bible famously translates Exodus 22, 18 as, Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. In other words, meddling with spiritual powers, seeking to use the spiritual realm for your own benefit, endangers the well-being of the individual and the community. It does not create a right relationship between human beings and the spiritual world. At the very least, such practices lead people away from trusting in the Lord. And at the worst, they open people to the influences of the demonic, the spiritual forces of evil that oppose God's will and human flourishing. God sets these things as equivalent to human sacrifice in this passage. 
in Deuteronomy. And no matter how these scriptures have been abused or misapplied over the years, and they have been, the main point, the true point, is still worth paying attention to. Despite the general skepticism about mystical things in our own day, there's still a thriving industry in divination, fortune-telling, contact with the paranormal. What's more, in recent decades, as people have recognized the limitations of this modern worldview, and how it really does not address the reality of our spiritual nature, and the spiritual world, there's been a resurgence in interest in the occult and pagan practices. Now, there's an entire religion now, Wicca, that kind of tried to rebrand witchcraft as a kind of eco-friendly proto-feminism. And, and again, a lot of this stuff that you find is just fakery to defraud the gullible, but the spiritual world is real. And if you fool around with darkness, there's always the possibility you're going to encounter something that you would really rather not deal with. So Christians should not dabble in this sort of thing. Again, we're not talking about fantasy stories that are fiction and fake, and everybody knows that they're fake. We're talking about the actual practices that people, even today, sometimes do that fly under this heading of magic or divination or whatever you want to call it. Christians just shouldn't touch it. And what's more, we don't have any need to. We have access to the ultimate source of spiritual power, God himself, through the Holy Spirit that indwells every believer. No matter what it is that people think they're going to get by getting into magic, witchcraft, divination, fortune-telling, whatever it is, God has something better and stronger and more whole than whatever that is. But, here's the kicker. Accessing this power of God requires humility. Magic is about being in charge and bending the forces of the spiritual realm to your will. Prayer is entirely different. Prayer isn't about commanding God to do something. Prayer is supplication, asking God to do something that we believe is in accordance with His will. And implicit in the act of prayer is the acknowledgement that God might say no. We pray with the understanding that the Lord knows better than we do. We ask but we do not, we cannot compel God to alter His will to conform to our own judgment. We pray in faith. <clears throat> following Jesus means that you are, in fact, following. You're not in charge. Jesus is Lord. And even if you aren't tempted to indulge in occult rituals or dive up the psychic hotline, we're all still tempted by the basic attitude behind magic. We want power. We want control. We see how this is the attitude at work here in this morning's scripture reading. During the persecution that arose after the death of Stephen, many believers scattered. And Philip went down to Samaria and he started preaching the gospel. And his preaching was accompanied by signs of power and spiritual authority. Not because he harnessed the power of God to be able to do what he wanted, but because God was working through him in accordance with God's own will and purpose. We see a lot of this kind of stuff in Scripture. We see miracles, things that work outside of the realm of natural laws, of ordinary cause and effect. But it's not magic when it's godly people at work, because it's always presented in Scripture as God at work through an individual. The person is not controlling this. They're not the ones pulling the levers and calling the shots. It is the power of God at work according to His good will and purpose. 
And of course, the power of God is far greater than anything anyone else can scratch together. But one of the people who's very impressed with this is a fellow named Simon, who is familiar with some kind of magic. The scripture doesn't tell us exactly what he's been up to here, but whatever sort of thing he was into, it certainly impressed the Samaritans. He seems to have been able somehow to tap into some kind of spiritual power and do amazing things. And everybody thought he was great. Matter of fact, he told them he was. <laughs> and they're saying, they're agreeing with him. They love this guy. Simon, the power of God is all great. Uh, and I don't think it's a stretch to suggest that's why he's gotten into magic in the first place. He leads, seems to like the power and the adulation. And he meets Jesus. And he repents of his old ways, he believes in Jesus, follows Philip, but that desire for power is still there. So when news of Philip's ministry reaches Jerusalem, two of the apostles, Peter and John, come on down to Samaria. And in this instance, the Holy Spirit hasn't yet fallen upon the new believers in Samaria. The book of Acts, you see the Holy Spirit shows up kind of in different times relative to when people come to know the Lord. And in this case, they believe, they're baptized, they haven't received the Holy Spirit yet. And when Peter and John show up, people get the Holy Spirit. They're imparting the Spirit through the laying on of hands. But Simon doesn't just want the Holy Spirit. He wants the power to give people the Holy Spirit. You get that? He, he wants the Holy Spirit to obey him. When he says, you go to that person, the Holy Spirit's got to go. And if he says, no, no, then the Holy Spirit's not going to. He wants to control God. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given to the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, give me this power also, so that anyone in whom I lay my hands might receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter, who really is pulling a bunch of here, says, May your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither heart nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. This is the difference between magic and saving faith in Jesus. Magic is about control so that you can be great. And that's a temptation that exists in our lives apart from anything that we might call magic or a cult or anything of that nature. This desire to be the one who is in control, in charge, called shots. But your only true hope, your salvation is found in acknowledging that God is far greater than you are. And allowing Him to be the one in control. He already is. <laughs> you just need to acknowledge him. To his credit, Simon seems to get the message here at the end of this passage. He, he repents. He says, ask Peter, pray for me the Lord that I might be forgiven this and that these things will happen. Uh, so Simon repents. But do you? When you approach God, is it to trust Him more fully, to understand His will more perfectly, and follow Him more faithfully? Or is it because you want God to do something for you, and you think that if you ask in just the right way, He'll advance your plans? The first is prayer. The second is a lot more like that. Do you see this life as an opportunity to grow into the kingdom of God? Or do you just hope that a relationship with God will make you more successful here and now? Do you believe that Jesus will steer your life on the best possible course, no matter what happens from a worldly point of view? Or do you want to take back the wheel as soon as things get rough? <laughs> Jesus shows us that there's more to reality than just the world as it is, not to give us a leg up or more leverage in this life, but to direct us to a hope and a future. 
And the way there is by following Christ in pursuing humility and faith, not power and control. So as Proverbs says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. Don't be like the magician. The witches, the sorcerers, be like Jesus. Let's pray. O Lord, we acknowledge that your power is very great. You are Lord of all, and Lord above all. Lord, help us to draw near to you with humility. Lord, grant us an increased measure of faith that we may look to you and trust you and follow in your ways instead of seeking out our own plans and our own paths. And we thank you, Lord, that you did not use this power against us, but rather you emptied yourself of the form of a servant and being found in human likeness you became obedient to death even death on a cross so Lord as we gather here we remember your death for our sake we come here acknowledging that we are not worthy of this salvation that we have sinned against others and against you we thank you for the sacrifice of your body and blood that we might be redeemed and brought into a right relationship with the spiritual realm. Thank you. And Lord, we praise you that because of what you have done, your name is exalted above every name. That the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the glory of God the Father. Lord, we confess today, you are Lord, you are God, and it is in you that we trust, not in any power, any other power, in heaven or on earth or under the earth. So, Lord, gather us to yourself and turn these elements from ordinary use to a sacred use for this time that we may truly enjoy communion with you and with each other through our faith in you and your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you are welcome at this table. And here we take the bread. And we remember on the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus himself took the bread as he sat with his disciples. And he blessed it. And he broke it. He gave it to them, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And so we remember. That the power of God is not found in control, but in giving himself for you and me, so that we might be redeemed. Take this bread, this symbol of the body of Christ. Remember what Christ has done for you.
because of his great love. Take this cup with this symbol of the wounds of love. And remember that by the blood of Christ, you are made clean and made clean. Take and drink. Oh Lord, we thank you for these symbol, these reminders of your grace and power. Reminder of the invitation to all people to come to you, find forgiveness. But often, Lord, as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death until we come again. We await that day when all will be made right and new. And Lord, until that day, be for us a mighty fortress. In the midst of the perils of this war. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning is Reformation Sunday. We remember the, the launch of the Protestant Reformation over 500 years ago. Martin Luther was one of the key people whom the Lord used in that movement. And so we're going to sing as our closing song Martin Luther's famous hymn. A mighty fortress is our God. Let's stand and sing together.
of the kingdom of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and walk in His light, and reflect His light wherever you go, today and always. Amen.